So, uh, Morgan, you're running for Ohio's third district against a as a uh, primary challenger to a um, four term incumbent, Representative Joyce uh, Beatty. Tell us a little bit about the uh, Ohio's third district. Yeah, so Ohio's third district is a gerrymander district, a very safe Democratic seat, and just in terms of you know demographic makeup, all that. So it's it's entirely in Franklin County, which is the county where Columbus, Ohio sits, but it actually is made up of you know more communities outside of Columbus, Reynoldsburg, Whitehall, um, Bexley, some other cities, and you know it's 30% black, uh, 11% foreign born, 6% Latino. So you know very very diverse community, um, but also one that has seen a lot of of the um, other side of the economic picture that our country is experiencing and that, you know, for 50 percent of the people, the economic boom and the economy growing that's happened in Columbus has not hit them. Wages have been fairly stagnant, and that can be especially acute in a state with a minimum wage of $8.55. Wow. And um, what uh, what of the uh, opioid crisis out in Ohio? I mean, uh, Ohio has been in the news uh, quite a bit, uh, not necessarily uh, Franklin County, but uh, I'm just curious as to To what extent um, has that been taxing the resources of that community? Opioid crisis is huge. So, you know, even though some of the national stories focus on other parts of Ohio, certainly within Franklin County and and, and within um, the third district, there are a lot of people that are either experiencing addiction themselves or have family members that have experienced or unfortunately already passed away from addiction. And so that's a big issue. And I mean, and that's one of the things I have on the platform Medicare for all. I mean, we need to get people treatment and not criminalize addiction um, and also get people the resources that allow them to restabilize their lives, having housing that is affordable, having jobs that, you know, identify a path beyond just life in the streets that's going to be economically feasible. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things that my platform is giving that that will help to address that crisis. But, yeah, it certainly has hit a lot of communities within the third district hard. All right. So, you know, we're doing a, um, a, a series, essentially, of, of, of primary challengers to, uh, to Democrats, um, particularly with a focus on ones who have, um, you know, uh, are, are, are primarying the incumbent from the left. Uh, but give us a sense of, of what it is that made you jump into this race. What, what did you see um, that the incumbent wasn't doing that you felt needed to be done? Yeah, so, you know, I was born in the third district at Ohio State Hospital. Um, Ohio State is in the district, and I was given up for adoption. I lived in a foster home and was adopted and raised on the east side. And, you know, my family went through a lot, especially early on in my life, but it opened up opportunity for me to get financial aid to go to an elite college prep school, Columbus Academy, that is also in the district, and really showed me, you know, economic segregation, income inequality at a very early age, and set me on the path I've been on to try to do something about that. And, you know, what I had increasingly been seeing in the last year or so is that, you know, what we're doing, the incremental policy approaches of the last 40 years are not working. And we know that to be true because communities in this district have either unchanged poverty levels or formerly middle class areas have slowly deteriorated over the course of my lifetime. And we need to be moving faster. And in fact, there is a movement that's moving with urgency to actually pass legislation that's going to do something about making sure everybody has access to health care, a home, doing something about the environment, you know, these really systemic issues. And so for me, you know, I, I had to be honest with myself. It's like, you know, this is what I'm about and this is the movement that's happening right now. And I felt like real people living in this district would support a more progressive platform if given the opportunity. And, and so we decided to go for it and launch this on July 1st. Uh, so you've been at it now for about, uh, I guess, what, uh, quick math, three or four months. Um, give me a sense of, of how it's going. I mean, I want to move in. Um, well, before we get there, actually, because uh, I'm really curious about um, uh, about your um, uh, ab- ab- about how you grew up and that sort of that um, that dichotomy of coming from uh, a um, uh, in a, a foster home and, and, and being adopted uh, living, you, you know, a home life being one where there was a lot of economic stress, uh, financial stress, um, but at the same time having access to going to a school with um, a lot of uh, wealthy people. And um, mm-hmm. follow, I mean, I'm curious just about that experience because, you know, we've interviewed people in the past where um, uh, where, you know, there's been some uh, research on that. I'm just curious as to, you know, how that realization came and how that adjustment was. 
I mean, I think it was one of the most pivotal moments of my life. From the moment I stepped on, on, foot onto that campus and recognized at age 10 that, you know, I thought everybody was leading kind of a similar type of life. And, you know, by no means was I living in destitute, you know, conditions or anything. I was fortunate. You know, my mom worked in the public school system. So that equals stable job, benefits, union, all of these things that enable families and individuals to weather a lot of different types of financial stresses. But there were stresses nonetheless. Right. And then you go into an environment where you see that there are just unlimited resources for kids and families that are never experiencing that type of stress. And it had a huge impact on me. And I, you know, my, I think, uh, especially when you're adopted, you're thought, you're aware that, you know, your life could have gone in a lot of different directions mm -hmm. and it's not so special you as an individual, right? I mean, it's kind of random how you end up. And so really feeling like this can't be, this can't be that just because of the zip code you're born into or a school district, or if your parents happen to have money that you sometimes get science class and sometimes you don't. And then like I experienced, then you get into this environment where not only are we doing science all the time, but we're going to have a science lab for 10 year olds that they have access to. And I still remember that moment of getting into classrooms in the, the prep school and, and you could hear the fish tanks bubbling. Right. And you're like, wow, that was a level of peace and quiet in the classroom that I had, ne had never known before. And so, you know, that, but, and you didn't have to travel very far. I mean, I think that's the interesting thing about this district, even though, you know, it's like geographically wide, taking up a lot of Franklin County, these things are, these areas are not that far apart. So for me, that was a 15 minute drive journey from the life that I had known into a whole different ballpark of existence. And it's that these contrasts are so stark and sometimes just very block to block that, you know, we really have, to, you have to be honest with yourself about like, what are we, what are we doing here? Right. And how are anyone in this community, uh, are we really saying they're of different value than someone who is that 15 minute drive away? And that was never, never okay with me. And I don't think that's really the vision of the American dream that we claim to care about. Uh, being adopted and having that insight about um, uh, how randomized and, and, and lucky, uh, how much luck has to do with the luck of birth. And I guess, uh, and, and just subsequent to that, uh, implicates the rest of your life um, is, yeah. is is fascinating, and and we should say you went on uh, uh, to go um, to Tufts. Uh, you got a an advanced degree at Princeton, and then you went on and got uh, uh, your legal degree at Stanford, uh, and then worked for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. G give me a sense of I mean that was uh, that must have been you know, when it was almost uh, a, a completely new um, agency. Uh, give us a sense about your experience there. Yeah, that was an incredible experience. You know, I mean, after the financial crisis, um, we all saw, right, there are a lot of people and we continue to see that, you know, we're really hit hard by that and recovery took a long time and it's still continuing. And so, you know, being able to be part of a federal agency that was actually it, uh, realizing the vision I have for the federal government where, you know, it has resources and a mandate to actually get something done for working people, incredible experience. And we did it, you know, $12 billion back to 28 million consumers um, over the course of my time there. And, and you saw that, you know, it is possible to actually hold companies accountable when they are trying to prey on working people that really just need markets and financial products to be fair without, you know, really having the time to read through the fine print. And so that's what we were working to, to fight for at the CFPB. And so I started in the office of regulations there doing rule writing. I was part of the, the rulemaking team that um, wrote rules to regulate the prepaid card market. It was the financial alternative, you know, financial product to a traditional checking account that hadn't really had um, robust regulation before. And then I served as a, um, a senior advisor to the first director of the Bureau and oversaw, you know, payday lending legislation or regulation development, policy development, uh, credit reporting, mortgage servicing, you know, a whole host of things. But, you know, it was, um, it, it truly is what we should have the federal government do. So that's a big part of my platform is, you know, the things like housing, uh, making sure that people earn enough money to live. These are the things that we, we need the federal government to actually be investing resources into. And this could be, this is something the federal government used to do, but we kind of got to get back on track and recognize that that is the most responsible use of resources for the gov federal government to be using. Developing a commitment to the idea of financial stability, and uh, uh, that's the first point, uh, your plank, I should say, on your platform, uh, financial stability, uh, and specifically the programs of universal child care, jobs guarantee, tuition-free public college, universal income, 
federal minimum living wage, Medicare for all. Uh, those are incredibly ambitious um, uh, programs. What's the one that you think, if you had to prioritize one, what would you say is the most important? It's it's pretty hard to say. I mean, I have all of them on there, and that's you know feedback I certainly got when we launched. Is like, whoa, you know, Morgan, this is this is kind of everything. It's like, yeah, this is everything because these are the things that we need that working people need to be okay. And you know, like we talked about before, I mean, I've seen what it's like when you know families experience stress when things start to go off the rails a bit, and what it takes to actually stabilize and weather those types of storms. And we're now putting people, individuals, families in positions where they are completely vulnerable to any type of stress, right? And that's not okay. And so how do we fight back against that? We fight back against that by making sure that people are earning enough money to live, that they're not getting sunk by medical costs that everyone is prone to experience. And if you don't, well, God bless you, but you know, it's probably coming, right? And and so a lot of these are systemic things like Medicare for all, universal child care, which is also becoming almost like a, a middle class issue for people. Even people that are earning, you know, fairly decent wages are feeling the crunch of not being able to afford uh reliable and, and um good quality child care. But then also we need to think about the realities of, you know, as we work towards these systemic solutions of bottom line, what's happening to people right now. And, you know, we saw at the CFPB that a lot of families and the research has been done by the Federal Reserve that a lot of families, individuals are not able to uh, make meet their expenses month to month because of $400 shortfalls in one of the richest countries in the world, right? Mm-hmm. So that's not okay. So that's why I have some, you know, on their universal income because, we need to we need to kind of like plug that gap right away as we work towards some of this more systemic change. So, but you know, ultimately, what's driving my platform is the building blocks of what people need to be stable, and it's not complicated. And we used to do it, and we've got to get back to it, which is housing, earning enough money to live, doing something about the climate. Now, we also did recently add to the platform uh, public safety, addressing police how we approach policing in our communities, which has been a big issue in the third district, and certainly making sure that we don't have people dying at the hands of police and through police violence is another important component of making sure that neighborhoods, individuals, families are able to thrive. And we should say you uh, you also uh, support the Green New Deal, which includes um, at least some of those um, uh, planks of the platform of financial stability. Uh, I also noticed mm-hmm. that you, you talk about stable housing, which is not something that you, you hear a lot from uh, congressional candidates. Um, I have a sense of why it's that important. Today it was uh, just reported this week in, in, uh, in New York City, over 100,000 students who go to school every day, have no, um, have no homes. Um, and it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, but uh, d- uh, just talk a little bit about your ideas of housing. Yeah, this was an important one to me to, you know, lead with because I actually have a bit of a professional background in this. So, you know, before launching this campaign, I was working for an organization called LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation that invests in affordable housing. And in that position, you know, I was traveling around the country and seeing the affordable housing crisis that is taking place across America and the accompanying homelessness crisis, to your point there. And, you know, really, it's a systemic issue. What is happening in every single major metropolitan area in our country it is a systemic issue, and that's when we need the federal government to step up and do something about it. And, you know, and, and locally in Franklin County, there's a 54,000 unit gap for affordable housing. Because why? Because housing prices are increasing because the population is growing and the economy is growing, but not for everyone. And wages have stagnated. So people cannot keep up affordable housing, affordable for whom? That's a big refrain that we're hearing in the third district. And so, you know, I have on the platform there, part of that is just increasing the supply, making sure that we are producing more housing, but also putting pressure on substandard landlords that are putting substandard housing onto the market to force them to do something about that. And also thinking about national rent stabilization. So the role that federal policy could play in putting some limitations on how much property owners, landlords are able to profit off of, you know, basic necessity, which is housing as we have more and more renters that are um, in our market, given, you know, the pressures of outside investors buying property and all of that. So, uh, it's, it's just so fundamental, you know, it's, like you said earlier, you know, people that are going through drug addiction, for example, I mean, you're never going to bounce back from something like that when you can't even get a, a stable home. So right. it's a it's a really important part of, of any of anyone's life. 
Uh, when you announced in July, um, I think you had told The Intercept that um, you saw uh, AOC, Ayanna Presley, Ilhan Omar, uh, Rashida Tlaib, the uh, so-called squad, as, as role, role models. I mean, give us a sense of, of how you perceive, you know, I guess the, the way that they are exercising and accumulating power, how you see yourself, uh, your perspective on, on power and how you would wield it in the context of uh, 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 of of Congress, um, uh, specifically, you know, the, those four in particular, but also uh, other members of the freshman class have been um, much more aggressive, uh, both in terms of like uh, progressive policies, but also from a partisan standpoint than we've seen in the past from Democrats. I want to just get your take on that. Well, you know, I think what I find inspiring about them and what they're doing is they're driving agendas that are informed by people by their constituents. And, you know, that's certainly where I'm coming from with this in launching a grassroots campaign that is 100% people driven is, you know, then you, the, the mandate you have is coming directly from the people. So you move as urgently, as urgently as the people are feeling the issues that they're going through. And trust me, when I tell you that in the third district, there are a lot of people that are feeling an incredible amount of urgency around the issues that our platform is addressing and expect our representatives to be doing more. And that's why so many people are coming out to support our progressive platform. So, um, you know, that once you're there and once I'm there and, and part of Congress, you're you're then able, that is what is informing <laughs> your voice, uh, you know, what committees you're on to address that platform and coming into these positions with a platform that already, uh, ha- that people are paying attention to what you're saying and what you're doing and trying to bring that accountability to Congress. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a whole different playbook. And this was certainly true for me in launching this campaign. You know, no one from the party said it was my turn or, or anything like that. And so I entered to, you know, the running as a Democrat and all of that, I'm, I'm entering to get things done. I'm not looking to build a career. And I think that's what we need to have more of is people in Congress that are coming with an agenda to accomplish things quickly move efficiently and get results for the constituents as quickly as we can. So um, that's, that's certainly a model that we're seeing now is, is, you know, people are having more success with and you're seeing it play out and that there are a lot of people like me that are challenging uh, incumbents and really trying to drive the legislation that we know is going to have an impact for working people and make sure our economy works for everyone. Uh, That's great. And uh, we should say that you've had um, uh, tremendous uh, fundraising, um, um, uh, most of the vast majority of which uh, under $100 in terms of donations, but uh, wildly successful. And uh, people can find more information at morganharper.org, uh, where you've got your mm-hmm. platform. And I imagine you're looking for uh, support, uh, both uh, in terms of, uh, of dollars and in terms of volunteers. Uh, Morgan Harper, uh, running in Ohio's 3rd District. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. 